Hello, I'm happy to uh, welcome you to this uh, history program. I'm Judy Woodward, the history coordinator of the Ramsey County Public Library. Today we are extremely pleased to welcome David Lebedoff, who will be talking about the 1968 uh, convention, the Democratic Convention in Chicago, and so much more from that historic year. David Lebedoff uh, is the author of a book, Ward 6, about local politics to national politics, um, how the events came about. I'm sure he'll talk about that some more. He is a distinguished uh, attorney, and I discovered talking from him, with him before the uh, program began, he was a, a fellow parent of mine. We had uh, uh, children who went to the same school back in the 90s. So uh, David Lebedoff's uh, uh, performance uh, presentation today is made possible by the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, our longtime partner, and through the generous financial support of Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, which came into being through the passage of the Legacy Amendment by the voters of Minnesota, which is to say by all of you. So thank you very much, and I'm going to turn the podium over to David Lebedoff. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and it's very, very good to be here today and see you all. I, I spoke to, years ago, I spoke to uh, seniors in a high school in Minneapolis. The teacher asked me to speak because they had gotten to the war on Vietnam. I mean, I see people of all ages here, but there are a lot of people in America. 1968, which in my view is the worst year in American history, was uh, 50 years ago. And we keep seeing in the papers today reminders. When it's the anniversary of the Martin Luther King assassination, there's articles in, in, on June 5th, there will be articles about the assassination of Robert Kennedy. There are all kinds of it's such a landmark in our culture that there will be reminders all through the year, and every one of them it seems to me is unpleasant, and it recalls a difficult time. But it's a time that I think has affected our own time today very much, and that's what I'd like to talk about too. Um, I uh, I spoke to uh, this high school, and uh, th these were you know 17-year-olds and. Uh, uh, the teacher said I, I, I he had read my, my this is my book Ward Number Six Scribner's about which I wrote shortly after 1968 it came out in 1972 and uh, I'll tell you how I came to do that but but uh, he said can you explain the war they don't know anything about it and they've never heard of it so I said uh, how many of you in this room have seen a movie in the last year in which the villain of the movie was either the president of the United States or the CEO of a major corporation. And every hand went up and I said, that was the war in Vietnam. <laughs> and uh, I don't think that's an exaggeration. There was a change in our culture. There are people here who go back as far as I do or further and it was a different culture before 1968 and after 1968. And, um, and uh, while we've had some wonderful things happen in our culture in terms of opportunities for people who didn't have it before, not all the changes in our culture have been good. And uh, uh, distrust, uh, distrust of government and uh, the the, the rules of our political process have been changed, I think, much for the, the, our political process has been changed much for the worse, which explains a lot of uh, recent events. Uh, so I graduated from Harvard Law School in 1963. Uh, the, I went to work, my first job, I was being an assistant attorney general of the state for Attorney General Walter Mondale, who was himself about 33 years old. And this, we were all young. And uh, then two years later, he was appointed to the U.S. Senate. 
because uh, Hubert Humphrey had become vice president under Lyndon Johnson, and so there was a Senate vacancy, and Mondale was appointed to do it, and he had to run two years later. So he asked me if I go out to Washington and work for him. I had known him, I worked for him, and we knew each other quite well, and um, I was sort of a link between, he was running between his campaign and his office, and I, I moved to Washington for a year and worked there, and then I came back. That was the arrangement, and uh, it was very interesting. But by that time, being a close aide to a senator, I had really gotten to know a lot of people, and I started to practice law in Minneapolis, and I was, uh, things were going along. It was 1967, and the phone rang, and a friend of mine uh, called and asked if I would run to be the uh, president of my ward club, which was the sixth ward of Minneapolis, which was the area, it's the area around Cedar Riverside of Minneapolis, you know. The, I lived in the Towers apartment house downtown, which strangely enough was in that ward, but it was not typical of the ward, which was in those days uh, full of students and, uh, and uh, low income. And uh, so, uh, he was an officer of the Hennepin County DFL party, and he wanted a friend who called, and he want, wanted me to run to be ward chairman. He looked to see who he knew who lived in that ward. I said, well, I, all right. Uh, so I went, and I started getting active in this ward club, which was all young students. And one of the reasons I wrote a book, and one of the things I wanted to share with you today is that, incredibly enough, all of the events of 1968, the anti-war movement, the fighting, the, the, uh, the candidates, all really had a Minnesota origin. And much of, much of what happened started in Minnesota and took place in Minnesota. Uh, the, um, when, when we finally got to the convention in Chicago, I stood on the roof of the Chicago Hilton Hotel during that convention, looking at fires and police and tear gas and, and uh, noise and sirens. And on one side of me was Walter Mondale, on the other was Hubert Humphrey. This all started from this little voyage, to this phone call to say, go run in your, for ward club chairman. <laughs> so the ward they needed someone to run in was uh, a ward uh, composed, uh, the DFL side, uh, almost entirely of, of uh, students and other and young people, uh, other young people. So uh, I joined the ward club and I, I think I did get to be the chairman, but I, but that was not a huge position, but, there was starting to be a movement in opposition to the war in Vietnam. Now, Vietnam uh, is I, I, I think getting involved in Vietnam was one of the worst mistakes ever made by public officials. And they didn't do it through evil motives but they, a mistake is a mistake, and it cost, it cost uh, not only the lives of, what, 250,000 uh, Americans, but, uh, and God knows how many Vietnamese, millions of Vietnamese, but uh, it, it really had a terrible effect on our culture as well. In any event, uh, Vietnam was, you all know, I think, where Vietnam is, and uh, it was, it's in the news again. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's always in the news, and so is that part of Asia. But um, the, after World War II was followed by the Cold War, and there were numerous occasions of standing off against the Russians and threat of nuclear war. The, the most dramatic were the Korean War, which was a battle in the Cold War, and then uh, shortly, uh, and then when, when Kennedy was president, the Cuba Missile Crisis, which we, those of you who were around will remember vividly, uh, 
And um, so we were used to, uh, there, there was an American strategy of containment of the Soviets, which eventually I think was successful, but it, it, there were years of very, very, very great danger. Um, we talked about having children in the same school. I, w w when the Berlin Wall fell down long after the stuff I'm talking about today, I was walking through the room and my, children, my three children were watching television and I said, what's that? And it says, the Berlin Wall fell today, the Cold War is over. And frankly, I burst into tears. <laughs> my children said, what's the matter? And I said, for the first time in my life, I don't have to worry about my children being killed by a nuclear war. Uh, and uh, not to mention my wife and myself. And uh, the, uh, but Vietnam was a place that um, was then and now adjacent to China. And um, there were, the French had fought, a, it had been a French colony, the French had, had tried to uh, retain it, the French lost to a native by native, the Vietnamese uprising, and uh, they, they left. And then um, North Vietnam, headed by Ho Chi Minh, was, uh, had, was allied with the communists, and they were trying to move into South Vietnam. And there was a theory proposed that the domino theory was very fashionable then, um, that if, if Vietnam fell, then Laos would fall, and Cambodia would fall, and Thailand would fall, and so on and, and so forth. So we had to get in and stop them, just as we had gone into Korea uh, to uh, stop them. So there were, uh, at this time, 1967-68, uh, Lyndon Johnson was president. President Kennedy had begun, John Kennedy had begun getting involved a little in, in Vietnam. And there were, I think, there were soldiers there, but I think only a few thousand. And um, then when Kennedy was killed, Johnson became president. Johnson expanded the war, and Humphrey was his vice president. And um, the war was getting more and more and more troops. Eventually, there were hundreds of thousands of, of troops there, and people began, and it, and people were, Americans were being killed, progress did not seem to be being made, what were we doing there? And a lot of people began to question the war, and an anti-war movement arose. And these students, it first occurred on campuses among students. Uh, in those days, there was a universal draft. So students would be the first, male students at least, the first to be, had a more immediate involvement in that they might be drafted, but uh, students often lead uh, protests even if there isn't that threat. And there was no lottery in 67 or 68. You just could get, might get drafted. And uh, uh, I could, I could have been drafted, but I wasn't because they just didn't, they weren't using that many troops at that time. They never, no one ever called. So uh, in the ward club were a bunch of young students who were very, very angry about the, ward, about the war and they started to organize against it. And they wanted to get someone to lead the movement. And you can't, uh, how do you start an anti-war movement? And they actually, the first person who, the person who agreed to, to be a spokesman for the movement and to run against President Johnson. President Johnson was up in 1968. You know, he had, he had been vice president when John Kennedy was assassinated. Then he ran in 1964 and was elected. And then he was running for a second elected term in 1968 and supposedly a shoe in And this, so the question was, who will oppose him on an anti-war theme? And Senator McCarthy, Eugene McCarthy from Minnesota, um, 
agreed to do so, and he became the spokesperson for the anti-war movement. And that was considered by, uh, you know, I will tell you this, I've been active in politics for more than 50 years, and I have never once, never once known the conventional wisdom to be correct. And uh, everyone said, that this, that's not exaggeration, everyone, uh, Everyone said, well, this, you know, have a campaign against Lyndon Johnson, stop the war, da da da. da. That's not going to get anywhere, da da da. So, anyway, I was working with these kids because I'm in the ward club, and uh, I mean, it, was, it wasn't a job. I was practicing law, and the ward club met every month, maybe. and But I was became friendly with some of them, and they, they were, uh, I was older than them, but not that much older. And uh, we became friendly, and I, I was also opposed to the war, by the way, but I wasn't uh, opposed, I, I wasn't uh, a McCarthy supporter because I said then, and I think of it, well, I'm gonna show you that I was wrong, but, but, uh, but uh, I said that uh, if you oppose John, I'm against the war, it made no sense whatsoever to me. But but if you deny the president the endorsement, you'll split the party, and the Republicans, who were most of whom were supporting the war, would would win. And so what good would that do? And um, uh, you could say I was proven right because Humphrey eventually lost, and 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 Nixon won. But I wasn't right, and I'll get to that in a minute. So I got active in this, in this, uh, in this group, and and uh, they were opposing Johnson, and nobody, no party regular, hardly any, with the exception of Senator McCarthy, hardly any party regular, hardly any office holder in the land, even people opposed to the war, um, said they would vote against Johnson and support McCarthy, but students did. So anyway, the, the precinct caucuses in Minnesota came in March of 1980, uh, 1968, and um, we went to our precinct caucus and the kids were organized. They wanted to carry the sixth ward. Doing better than that was beyond their imagination, but they wanted this one little ward, it's a poor ward, but they wanted to get some delegates, anti-war delegates for McCarthy rather than for Lyndon Johnson. And so we go to the, I was chairing the meeting, and we had our precinct caucus on, uh, in, in uh, early March of 1968, and I go there and we, we open the doors, I think it was at a school, and uh, you, you would have you thought it was the state fair. There, there was the, there was, you never saw so many people in your life. Where they came from, I don't know, and they were, they were, it was not just young people. There were plenty of people of all ages and backgrounds who, had, who, wanted, who, who thought the war was a bad idea and wanted to vote for somebody who was opposed to the war. That was an issue. We talk about issues in campaigns, you know. Uh, there, there, uh, that, that was an issue, I mean. And uh, it was still possible at that time there weren't that many troops there. It was still possible to stop this. Uh, Johnson had no idea, no intention of stopping it, and uh, he was being advised. You know, there was a book called *The Best and the Brightest* by David Halberstam. The, the, the wisest, most brilliant. I'm not being sarcastic. People with the best credentials in the world uh, uh, were advising the president. Uh, uh, to stay in Vietnam, the communists don't respect weakness if we withdraw, da 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 da. And Johnson was, uh, uh, I think Kennedy, I think that if John Kennedy had still been president, he would have gotten out because I, I think he was a shrewd politician. But I think Johnson didn't want to be the first president to lose a war. Plus, he had all these. Uh, Johnson, though very smart, had an inferiority complex because he had had a very difficult, he'd been born in great poverty and had. Uh, didn't have the same kind of education that these advisors had, and so he, well, these guys must know. So, um, and then Humphrey was his vice president, and Humphrey was from Minnesota, so the whole establishment was for Johnson. And uh, I was what was called in those days an administration dove. Uh, 
it, you, that was somebody who backed the administration but was a dove on Vietnam. That's how there were administration doves and administration hawks. Most most of the people were administration hawks, but there were quite a few administration doves. But but neither but those were all people backing the administration so they wouldn't lose the election. And then then there were people opposed to the war who were McCarthyites, for for Eugene McCarthy. So anyway, this huge crowd turned out of the sixth ward and the students went crazy and they got all the delegates to the convention, next convention. And they were celebrating and they were happy and they were just beyond belief. And then the phone started ringing and it hadn't happened just in the sixth ward, it had happened in the seventh ward and the eighth ward. It happened in all 13 wards in Minneapolis. Incredible numbers of people showed up who hadn't showed up before, and they were against the war, and all of the delegates went to McCarthy. And this also happened in St. Paul, everywhere in St. Paul. And it also happened in the third congressional district, which then, and still somewhat today, is the suburban Minneapolis. So the whole metro area turned out, all those delegates were from McCarthy. And the first congressional district, which is in the south, you know, and uh, southern part of the state, and then and now I think had Rochester in it, now it does, but I, I think it did, was too close to call. Well, there's only eight congressional districts, you know, this is getting pretty, in Minnesota, so that's pretty close. You know, it looked like 50-50. And uh, as it turned out, the first district went by a very few votes to Johnson. But this was incredible. Incredible, and when you looked around the, uh, the, the the strongholds of the DFL party in the rural areas in northwestern Minnesota on the Iron Range and those places, there were a lot of anti-war people there too. Not enough to prevail, but lots of anti-war people. And it was, you didn't have to be too bright to see with your own eyes that this was something, you know, you see in movies something really happens and you think in real life it doesn't, but this, it was hard to miss. But I may say, most people missed it. And, uh, the, uh, and I remember, I remember distinctly, I had a friend, I, I've never said this publicly before, I, I had a friend who I'd known since, uh, he was about two years older than I, we were kids, our parents knew each other. And he had a job then, uh, 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 well, he was the chief, his name was Peter Edelman, and he, he was, uh, have you heard of Marion Wright Edelman, the civil rights worker, that's her husband. Uh, he, he, but he's from Minneapolis, and he, he was Robert Kennedy's chief um, uh, speechwriter, not speechwriter, uh, policy advisor. And um, I wanted to call him on the phone the next day and ask if I could come out at my own expense and fly out and see, talk to Robert Kennedy. And I didn't have the guts. And what I was going, what I would have said had I gone, and that you may now wonder why didn't I just call on the phone, I don't know. Uh, say, if I were you, I would advise Senator Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, to a senator from New York to get into the race before the New Hampshire primary, which was one week from the Minnesota caucuses. There was no publicity in the, in the national press that these Minnesota had, Humphrey's home state had almost gone for McCarthy. And, but the first primary was in New Hampshire a week later. And in that primary, uh, Everybody was after Kennedy to get into the race as an anti-war candidate because Eugene McCarthy, who was no longer with us, but I, I much respected him. He was very um, highly intelligent, but he was not a uh, he, he was not a perfect campaigner. He had no tolerance for fools, and he and he uh, was a person of great dignity and sarcasm, and he was. But the Kennedys were better at leading the mass movement than McCarthy, I think. But Kennedy was afraid to get in the race against the president of his own party. That, that was considered just almost treasonous back then. So the New Hampshire primary occurred, and you know what? Johnson won it, but he just barely won it. He's, he snuck through, and I believe, 
that Johnson's name was on the ballot, and if you wanted to vote for McCarthy, you had to write it in because it was a last-minute campaign. So the fact that McCarthy got what, 42, 43, 44% of the vote, which I think it was, was so astonishing, was so, I mean, talk about headlines, was so astonishing that very shortly thereafter, Lyndon Johnson made a speech on television at the end of which he announced that he was not going to be a candidate for re-election and he was withdrawing from the race. Well, that, I mean, that, that's a very, very startling announcement. And, um, and so if Johnson's not running, then who, who is running? Well, the anti-war people said McCarthy. And uh, th th three days later, a new person, three days after the New Hampshire primary, Robert Kennedy said he had seen the light and he was going to run for, as an anti-war candidate. I think, I, I don't mean to be rude to Kennedy, who I much respected, but I, and I knew slightly from when I worked for Mondale, a uh, very, very, very fine person. Uh, but I think that um, it seemed like such a hazardous course, but once the New Hampshire primary occurred, it seemed possible. So he did it, and he announced he was a candidate. Well, then a fight broke out between the McCarthy and the Kennedy people. McCarthy was there first. He should get it. You know, I, I'm such an old hack. I say win the election. You know, but uh, the uh, so there was a fight. And there were primaries, and I remember. Uh, uh, um, uh, there were some highly combative primaries, and I think that uh, McCarthy won the Oregon primary against Kennedy. But then Kennedy, uh, Kennedy won the um, California primary uh, against, which had then is now a huge amount of delegates against. Um, against McCarthy and Humphrey. And Humphrey was the candidate, administration candidate to support to replace Johnson. And, and then hours after winning the primary, Kennedy was tragically shot and killed in the kitchen of the hotel where the victory celebration was, and he died the next morning. So there was the anti-war movement only had McCarthy. There was no Kennedy. He had been killed. And uh, in Minnesota, we had a convention, a state convention then, and the two candidates for president at the Minnesota State Convention, you know, the state convention elects delegates to the national convention in Chicago. And the two candidates were both Minnesotans, Hubert Humphrey and Eugene McCarthy. And everyone at the convention knew both the candidates, you know. And it was a, the whole, the entire national press corps was out here and uh, they were, the convention was so close, so close because remember there were three congressional, there's eight congressional districts, three were for McCarthy uh, and the others were for Humphrey, but one of them very, very, very narrowly. So there was almost enough votes. So they got to the, but, but it, was, it was a very tense and difficult convention and Humphrey got the delegates, but the congressional, the, the people who won the fifth, just the Twin Cities got the delegates to the national convention from those, but you also have 20 at large delegates to a national, from Minnesota. And those 20 at-large delegates went to uh, Humphrey because, and the McCarthy people claimed, said, look, we have about, uh, we have about 45% of the delegates to this convention. We want 45%, <laughs> give us eight or seven or six, give us two. And uh, the Humphrey people said, uh, if the tables were reversed and we said this to you, would you do that for us? Well, the answer probably was no, they wouldn't, but this is, it was not a happy convention. And so Humphrey got the 20 delegates and people were mad at the rule of winner take all. And uh, then, we, then on to Chicago, and I went to Chicago. By that time, a friend of mine, uh, 
Wendell Anderson, who later became governor of the state, asked me if I would be the state coordinator for Humphrey, and I said yes. So I got to go to the National Convention. I'm at the Chicago Hilton Hotel, and words cannot describe what that was. It was just as bad as you see on television. Riots, tear gas, beating. I mean, you. I was as close as I am to you in the audience to, to people who were being hit on the head with clubs, and there's blood and tear gas and broken windows and, and, and people hauled into, thrown into police vans. Uh, there were thousands of National Guardsmen, policemen. It was, it, it was a terrible, terrible, terrible uh, uh, convention. And um, so that's when I stood on the roof between Mondale and Humphrey and I, I, Humphrey said to Mondale, you know, I think this means it's over for me, which turned out to be correct. So Humphrey was nominated. Humphrey, who in his heart of heart probably was not too enthusiastic about the war, didn't want to cross Lyndon Johnson. And even though Humphrey was the candidate for president, he got, he got endorsed in Chicago. But what I want to tell you today is I was at that Chicago convention. I sat there. Uh, it, I mean, I, with the Minnesota, I wasn't a delegate. I sat with the Minnesota delegation. I knew them all. I knew all the Humphrey people and all the McCarthy people, and I knew all of the, the campaign staffs, the two offices, and I went there and I knew them. I was a young guy then, but I, it just happened to be, I always say, in the right place at the wrong time. And, uh, the, and so all these people, all these people, um, uh, were fighting and yelling, but Humphrey became the hum, Humphrey became narrowly the uh, endorsed candidate. Uh, well, not so narrowly because most of the states used peace and caucuses, not primaries, and he had the delegates. But people felt there they'd been denied. What I want to tell you today is that if if Robert Kennedy had not been shot, I am as certain as I am of anything in the world that Kennedy would have been nominated at that convention for president and that he would have won the election. And that was a terrible loss. Not, not, I don't know whether Robert Kennedy would have been a good president or a bad president. I'm not trying to promote any candidate or any party. But he had the charisma and, and to war, and it would have been a steamroller, I believe. He would have won the Humphrey almost won the election because Humphrey moderated his position in the war a little bit and came very, 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 very close to winning that election against Nixon, but he lost. I believe that uh, I believe that Kennedy would have won, and if Kennedy would have won, if Kennedy would have won the election, which I believe he would have, one of the things he would have done probably within a week of the inaugural would have been to end the war. And a majority of the people of the American troops who were killed in Vietnam were killed after 1968, you know. And it doesn't excuse the people who were fighting there before, but it would have made a huge difference. But it didn't happen, and the war, as you know, outlasted Nixon. Nixon resigned as president into his in a second term, and the war was still on. You know, I've never understood why Kissinger keeps getting all these Nobel awards because for his peace plan, because the war, you know, what, so far as I'm concerned, the war ended when the North Vietnamese climbed up on the roof of the American embassy. You know, uh, what was the negotiation there? Uh, in any event. What happened then is the most important thing about 1968. A great many idealistic young people had opposed the war in Vietnam. And they wanted it to end, and they, uh, they wanted to elect a candidate. And then not only did they not elect their candidate, but they didn't end the war. And the war went on and on. And um, Nixon had kind of cynically uh, eliminated the draft and so it, it was a little less opposition. But it went on and on, and people, thoughtful people who had opposed the war began to think that the political system does not work. Here we are, everybody we know is against the war, and all these people turned out. Well, really, more people turned out in the primaries for Humphrey, but 
you can understand perfectly well why people felt uh, that their hopes had been dashed. And so some of the very uh, most thoughtful people in the country did something that I think is very unfortunate. They changed the rules of our political process. They made it harder and harder to, I think a certain distrust of majority rule crept into a lot of educated people's minds. And so they changed the rules and they made it more difficult. In the precinct caucuses in Minnesota where you used to open a door and everybody came in and then they were out an hour, precinct caucuses tended to last seven hours and a parliamentarian would have not been able to to follow the proceedings. They were archaic, and then you had, and then you had rules, so you couldn't have any more winner take all. You had to divide, you had to get your proportional share. What could be more fair than proportionality? Well, the problem with proportionality is, this, if you take a DFL caucus, this is the, the McGovern Fraser guidelines were passed in 1972. Also, Don Fraser from uh, Minneapolis helped write those guidelines, uh, said you have to have proportional representation. Well, if everyone there agrees on economic policy and agrees on civil rights and agrees on health care and other things, then you can't proportion the delegates until you find something on which you disagree. You, you can't do it. The rules say you have to have proportionality, so you have to find that one issue that divides you and elect delegates on that. And Sure as shooting, an issue came along called abortion. And that, that was the way delegates were selected. And I understand and respect the passions on both sides of that issue. But, but that wasn't the only issue facing the country. And single issue politics stemmed from the so-called reforms after the, uh, after the, uh, the uh, failed Democratic Convention in 1968. And then other things happened. All the rules of all the parties got changed so that you had precinct, uh, so the precinct caucuses had to be long and boring. The, 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 the word boring was never written there, but trust me, if you'd put it to a vote, majority rule would have prevailed at least over that. Uh, and so the states, to get away with it, the only people who could stay up that late at night were young idealists maybe who didn't have to be at work the next morning. And so the, all the states quick switched to primaries. We didn't used to have all these primaries. States switched to them so they wouldn't have to have precinct caucuses that were run by a small group of organized people. So all the states had primaries. But then something else happened, because you start fooling around with history, a lot of things come into play. You, there's a law of unintended consequences. At that same time, television became a very big thing. And the thing about television is it was a very effective way to campaign. And it got into everybody's living room. And uh, there are plenty of people in this room who remember, as I do, when you didn't have television in your living room. But then you had it, it was in color, and you had big sets, and now they're 3D, and you, uh, uh, and, but, but you had television, and so it was everywhere, and it was also very expensive. And so all of a sudden, primaries, primaries were won by the candidate that spent the most money. And who gives money in a primary campaign? People with a single issue. And this is not a conservative fault or a liberal fault because both sides do it. They have, you know, so single issue money, each party has its demons, single issue money goes into ads for for uh, the candidates and they win it. And then something else happened along the way since 1968, which is the gerrymandering of almost every uh, political district in the United States so that only one party can win. And we've had gerrymandering. You know, gerrymandering is when you change the lines of the district so to ensure that a certain party will win. Well, this wasn't that the gerrymandering helped the Republicans more than the Democrats or vice versa, it was that it helped all incumbents. Because if you, if you have two districts that are next to each other, and you want one as a, just imagine St. Paul, Betty McCollum's, if you want to give her even more 
Democrats in her district, you got to put the Republicans somewhere. So you put them in the next district, and Michelle Bachman gets them. So everybody's district becomes more, instead of districts being 54 to 48 percent, they became like 75 percent for one party, 80 percent for one party. And we had an election about eight years ago, in which in November. Out of 435 congressmen, only three incumbents failed to be reelected. Now, you know, that's two parties, so issues didn't matter. So the only way you can lose an election nowadays, for Congress, for the House anyway, is um, to lose your primary. And that's, who's, who's, who decides the primary? The same people who buy the commercials we're doing the things before. So commercials in a primary where the average citizen is not going to contribute money got out of it. So through all these reforms and all these things, we've gotten to a s state in which our nation is not working as effectively as I think we wish it could. And I'm not here to, to praise one party or another or insult any candidate or anything like that. But our system, no matter who you're for, our system, I think our political system is working very, very poorly right now. And um, uh, and I think that's all a legacy of the division in the country from 1968 in which people didn't trust government, people didn't trust um, experts, people didn't trust, and people changed the rules so that the rules, instead of opening democracy to more people, open it to far fewer people and better funded people, and to, to, and where the votes of a few well-funded uh, fanatics count more than th that of the majority, really, in electing. And so it's very, very hard to uh, to run a system that way, and it's, it's deadlock. When the vote on Obamacare came around. I, I don't care if people are for Obamacare or against Obamacare. There's people I respect on both sides of that issue. But when the vote took place in the House of Representatives, every single Democrat voted yes and every single Republican voted no, without exception. Now, that's not what James Madison had in mind, you know. They were supposed to debate it and compromise it, and that's all vanished. So I'm, I'm getting near the end of my allotted 45 minutes, but that's what I think the war in Vietnam led to. It was itself, it, it was disillusioning because, it, one last thing I'll say, the students shouldn't have been so disillusioned. They started organizing really right in the middle of a camp, right in an election year, and there weren't that many of them, and they got an incumbent president to resign, that's quite a bit, you know. That was very effective, but I think a lot of people are, nowadays are more used to, are used to more instant gratification. And that wasn't enough. And I understand being impatient when there's a war on. But um, there was deep disillusion. And uh, I think a lot of that, and especially the rules changes. Rules are a boring subject. But trust me, they've played a terrible role in this whole thing, uh, too. And the way to run, um, you know, I think I think in the last, in 2016, uh, I, I think that uh, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, between them, probably got more votes in the primaries than all of those other people running. What, what, what was that about? People, people didn't like anything that was institutional. You see what I'm saying? So uh, I trace a lot of this back to the Vietnam War. And that, that those conclude my remarks, but I would be absolutely delighted to answer your questions. So thank you. And, and let me bring the mic around so that we can all hear the questions. And um, ooh, and I'm dropping my money here. Um, who has a question so we can hear the question and we can get their question recorded? OK, ma'am. I'm just wondering if you have a potential solution. <laughs> well, uh, uh, It always helps to have good candidates, I'll tell you. <laughs> you can talk about platforms, principles, it helps to put up a good candidate. And I don't think either one of our major political parties 
really did a great job in the last election in terms of recruiting candidates. But when there's no party structure, you see the young people did away with the party structure. Party structures groomed candidates. And um, there's no grooming ground anymore. However, one thing that could help a situation enormously would be to get rid of, of um, gerrymandering. The Supreme Court has a case in front of it right now, and I don't approve of the Supreme Court making law, but in this case, <laughs> I wish that they would rule that uh, it's unconstitutional to say that no incumbent can ever lose. It certainly wasn't, the framers of the Constitution never imagined that. And uh, I think there's a law in Iowa that says that uh, when you reapportion every 10 years, you have to try and make every district as close to even as possible. And so you don't have to make it 50-50, but it could, you know, 48, 52, you know, try as hard as you can. That would make a huge difference because it would only, you'd have to move to the middle and compromise in order to win. It would be the opposite of what we have today. So that would be the single best thing that we could do right now. Plus get some really good candidates uh, to run. As I say, if, if a, a crazy assassin had not shot and killed Robert Kennedy, the political system would have solved that problem, I believe. I, I don't know what kind of a president he would have been, but he, I think he would have ended the war. Any other questions? There's or? questions way back here. Let me bring the mic back. On that point, um, one of the striking things to me about the Ken Burns uh, documentary on Vietnam was the, the personal indifference, uh, probably not the right word, but from Johnson to Nixon to Kennedy and maybe even Eisenhower, their personal belief that we probably are not going to win the war and we probably shouldn't be there but I can't pull out, I can't do anything about it. So what gives you the kind of the confidence that Kennedy, or Robert Kennedy would have been different? Well, he was running on the platform of getting out of Vietnam. It would have been very hard not to had he won. And uh, also, that worked, I think he would have won. I mean, democracy does work. All these rules changes were based on the fact that democracy doesn't work, but it didn't work because some lunatic shot somebody in a hotel ballroom. It, 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 you don't always get what you want. We've all been disappointed in elections, but it would work. It is true, by the way, that people close to the situation did think it was impossible that we would ever win the war in Vietnam. Uh, I, I talked to many, many, many people who held high office, not, not necessarily from this state, and they privately, they thought it was an unwinnable war. You know, it was, in fact, when, when John Kennedy was elected president, you know how the president, incoming president stops and has tea with the outgoing president at the White House before the inaugural, so he stops and Eisenhower is the outgoing president and Kennedy has to, uh, they have to talk about something. He says, uh, have any advice for me? And Eisenhower says, yes, don't get involved in a war in Southeast Asia. <laughs> That's a true story. He says, you can't win a war like that. It's not like, it's not like Korea. It's not, it's, no, 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 it's jungles and they're patriots and da, 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 da. And then John Kennedy goes off to Paris and he meets with de Gaulle and he gets alone with de Gaulle in a room and he says, any advice for me? And de Gaulle says, yes, don't get involved in, in Vietnam. He was more specific. He said, the French tried that, and we got our whatever beat in Dien Bien Phu. We had to get out of there. Don't do it. You can't win it. Now, Dwight Eisenhower and Charles de Gaulle were two people who were experienced in warfare. And two sharp cookies in my book. And uh, it doesn't mean they were right, but in this case, they were right. I think Ken John Kennedy, had he not been shot, would have the opposition to the war was so great, not to mention the cost of it, the cost in lives and in money, that I think he would have tried to get out of it somehow. And uh, I, 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 I can tell you that one of the most powerful 
I, I, I can't tell you this because I vowed not to. I was in the room in Washington to see one of the most powerful conservative senators who ever lived propose to another senator who was, I, I happened to be in the room, that we get the dictator of Vietnam, we give him $5 million or $50 million or whatever it would take to ask us to leave because the war is unwinnable. So that was a widely shared perception and Ken Burns was right. People died, young people died, and uh, it was terrible. But are there, are there other questions? This gentleman. Yes, I have, I have one for you. Yes. Um, I was right in the middle of all that at the U of M campus. Oh. In fact, uh, I was there when the National Guard came out. Tear gas was all over the place. Uh, cops everywhere, soldiers, you name it. That was going on all over the country. But I'll push back on you a little bit. You said that a lot of people were getting, or a lot of people were being, were being swayed against the war. Older people, I don't think older people were swayed against the war until students started waking them up to realize what a dumb war it was and we should have never gotten in. Well, that's true. The students started it, but I think there was, it came first from the students, who as I say had a more immediate concern being, being drafted, but but there were plenty of older people who were opposed uh, to the war. I, in, in this book that I wrote about it, when, when the terrible year was over, just putting it down my personal memories of that year, there was a, uh, I met a man in the lobby of the building where I practiced law, and he had graduated from the, I, I reread that part of the book this morning, because I hadn't read it in many, many years. Yes, and I can't remember who it was, but he graduated from Yale in 1924. I got to call my brother after to say, who was that? And he was, he was, a, he was an elderly man. Uh, well, I thought he was elderly, let's see. I suppose he's older than I am. I suppose I'm older now than he is. But, but, uh, but uh, uh, I said, what do you think of those precinct caucuses that the kids won yesterday? He said, good for them. He said, that war is the dumbest thing I ever heard of in my life. There are a lot of people who are saying that. You know, a difference between 1968 and today, I mean, you're not wrong. It did come first from the young people. But a difference between 1968 and today is in 1968 at family dinner tables, people were yelling at each other. Kids were yelling at their parents. That's true. You know, and there were conversations about that. But today, it's in a sense, things are worse because nobody encounters an opposite viewpoint. People live in households in which everybody thinks the same, their neighbors all think the same, the, the magazines they read or the newspapers they read or the TV channels that they or cable that they choose to watch all have the same point of view, so nobody hears a contrary opinion. And that's a terrible thing. At least, I think that you're right that some, some young people did convince some older people, but that it's hard for that process to take place if you don't ever talk to them, you know, and which is a situation we have uh, today to some extent. Are there other, other there's yes. a lady. I always questioned what the Vietnam War was uh, really about. Was it really about the spread of communism or was it there, was it oftentimes in, when we have wars, it's about power, uh, control over resources, something like that. Um, I, and I know there was a lot of, of, of uh, what do you call them, the providers of military services and equipment that made a lot of money off that war. Was there something like that going on? I don't think there was in, uh, we used to hear that, but I don't know what the resources were in Vietnam that were so valuable to cost hundreds of thousands of lives, not to mention many, many, many hundreds of billions of dollars of taxpayers' money. Uh, but um, I think that the people really thought, I think those wise men, the best and the brightest, really thought, well, if Vietnam falls, um, Cambodia will fall, and Laos will fall, and it was, it was called the domino theory. And I thought that was ridiculous then, and I think it's ridiculous now. So far as that goes, there were a lot of supposedly very smart people who thought the war in Iraq was the greatest idea in the world, and that didn't work out very well uh, either. I think that uh, I, I think that the public, 
left to its, I'm a big believer in democracy, in majority rule. If the public were in, in charge, and we need representative government, you can't have policy made by, by standing in a square and shouting, but if the public were in charge, I think we'd have far, far fewer wars. Far fewer wars. Uh, the Second World War, you know, America wasn't in the Second World War until Germany declared war after Pearl Harbor. We got in the war because A, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and then about a week later, the Germans declared war on the United States. So, you know, that's how that war came about. And, um, but I don't blame people for being suspicious. What are they really doing this for? And I think the reason people are suspicious is that you can't, imagine something so stupid as fighting in Vietnam unless there were money involved. You'd think there must be, but I, I think people really are some, but the supposedly smartest people really are that stupid in my opinion. <laughs> uh, so uh, are there any other questions? Oh, there are, there are. This lady. What impact do you think the all-volunteer army, the lack of a draft, has had on politics and decision making? I think it's had a very bad effect. I think that, and I say that as one who didn't serve, I'm not proud, I didn't avoid it, but I, I didn't serve and uh, I, I can't honestly say I wish I had been in, in Vietnam fighting and getting shot at, but it was better for this country when everybody from every walk of life served together. And we, our army is increased smaller and smaller and smaller, and now they hire contractors. They hire contractors to do an enormous amount of the work, including fighting. Uh, and uh, the contractors don't have mothers who are gonna protest against the war, or if they do, uh, maybe they do. Uh, the, uh, there's fewer and fewer people, and it's not as representative, and people from the lower end of the economic scale serve in greater degree. It was a fairer situation in which everybody uh, served. You had a sense of your fellow citizens. Today we're isolated. Half the country thinks the other half is evil, and we know that's not true. We know that most people are decent trying to do the right thing, but we all have different information. and if we don't know each other. And people used to live in different kind of neighborhoods than they live in today. People used to live in neighborhoods where there, were, there was a variety of economic levels and uh, you had a whole range of the human behavior. Now you get a neighborhood and almost everybody's got the same income in this neighborhood and the same kind of job and the same level of education. And we don't really mix as a nation as much as we used to. But that's, I, I don't know what can be done about that. This John. Um, following up on that kind of, uh, do you think that Vietnam and the anti-war protest also led um, to the polarization within the country between the urban elites and like the white working class because, because you know, all those kids protesting weren't paying attention to the to the uh, um, their parents, but also the uh, you know the working class people who were actually doing most of the fighting, and were supporting the war because their kids were there, um, and obviously that has gotten much. You know that we we see that type of effect today. I'm I'm sorry to say that I think you're right. I think that the war, even when we had a draft, was fought primarily by. Uh, working class kids, not entirely, but uh, primarily. And um, you know, in those days, if you were a student until age 26, you didn't go in the draft. And it wasn't so difficult um, for people to stay in school to age 26, uh, and a lot of people did. And um, I think there is a class divide in America today, which has led to a big mess all over and between, um, there is, there are a lot more educated people than there used to be. In my father's time, 5% of the population went to college. Today about a third of the nation I think goes to college. And so you have people who 
are certified as educated and and uh, they get different jobs than people that pay better than people who don't have that background. And this has led to a class divide which didn't exist before. And it's very, very, very unfortunate. I think, I think that someday American business will figure out that you don't have to have a college degree right. to work in a large corporation and use your brains. There are smart people all over. And uh, and if you look at the at the recruiting ads for every corporation around here, for all the corporate jobs, I'm not talking about uh, manual work. For all the, for all the corporate jobs, even very you know mundane things, you know, it says four year degree required. There's no point for that. There's no point to that, you know. Uh, so the intelligence. My belief is that intelligence is very broadly scattered. And that if we put out cast a wider net, we'd get better people. But, yes, sir. Of the uh, 535 members of Congress, how many do you think had children that fought in Vietnam? I'd say I would say almost none. Two. Oh, two. Two out of yeah, 535 members of Congress. <laughs> and if you were Hispanic or black, your odds of dying were twice your percent of the population in the United States. Yes, and I, I, we, had, we had a family at our house for dinner, a, a black couple, and the man said he had served in uh, Vietnam, and he, he, he was such a, usually such a placid guy, but he got really uh, angry, and he said, you know, I felt like a jerk. Everybody in my whole platoon was either black or Hispanic. Other people weren't doing it. Well, you, you understand that's not right. And I, I think what a lot of people of color don't understand is that most people, white or whatever color, don't like that either. It's not a good system. It's not a good system. But we have a country now in which it's, it's not the 1% against the 99%. It's about, the, I'd say, 15 or 20% who have good jobs and a good future against about 80% who find their standard of living going lower than that, what their parents were, and that's not good for the country. It's not good, and it doesn't have to be that way. And that's, what, that's why elections, that's how elections are decided nowadays, over that issue. I'd like to ask a question. Yes. Going back to the 60s and uh, Minnesota, I'm not from Minnesota, uh, and Minnesota then, as now, was not a dominant state in terms of um, population, and yet, Minnesotans really dominated the uh, Democratic Party at the national level. What accounts for that? That is a wonderful question. <laughs> it's because we had a strong party structure here. You can't have politics. Right now, I'll let you in on a, a, a secret. There are no political parties in America. There is no Republican Party and there is no Democratic Party. There are people who claim to have those party labels and they have conventions, but there really is no party. There is the incumbent party and then there's those other two groups. And, uh, and, every, and uh, when you have an election every four years, different groups, I don't care if they're on the right or the left. I don't care if it's pro-life or pro-choice. I don't care whether it's the NRA or, the, or, 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 or global warming. People with... Uh, Causes they feel strongly about come up with money and elect people in the primaries, and uh, who do they get? Uh, photogenic people, people who say the most uh, outrageous or arresting things on TV. When you had a party structure, which Minnesota did, you know, before they reformed the party in 1972, there was something like 150,000 Minnesotans went to the precinct caucus, and last year there was 4,000. So, so much for opening the doors to the people, you know. Because why would you go unless you're a masochist, you know? Uh, or, or you have insomnia. So, uh, yes. Are there other questions? There's a lady. Okay, all the way back here. Oh. The changes you talk about um, in the rules for the DFL, because the Republican Party, I understand, didn't go through that dramatic thing, were because women had no access 
to power within the DFL, and that the big shift in the rules in 72 was that there was gender equality in positions and women, and that's why we came up with the walking caucuses, too. Well, that's, that's a point, and I will stand somewhat corrected. We, the, the American society, not just politics, American society was not, uh, was not open to women uh, back when I wrote this book the way it is now. My, my wife has made a good living as a lawyer. Uh, my sister, when we got out of school, got a job as a secretary. She worked herself up, her, her two brothers went to law school. We, we were triplets, we were the same age. We got the same grades in college and her two brothers went to law school and she got a job. Now she worked her way up and became a producer at WCCO, but that was, it was very hard for women and um, that was an advantage. The Walking Caucus was partly designed to get gender equality, but uh, it has not led to ideological uh, equality, which you could have. There's women represent all points of views, not just one point of view. And uh, it's, good, it's good that we, that we the, the, the biggest change for the good in my lifetime is equality of opportunity. And this goes for people of color too, though it's not as far as we, we should be, but uh, all of that has changed from when I, from, from First time I said this publicly, it's only been true for two weeks. I'm 80 years old, and it's a, it's a much better world today in those ways than it was then. There's no question about that. But that doesn't mean that we have to be divided in terms of, of rules. There must be some way to get female representation without having, uh, and, and also have a spectrum of ideas. You know, There are women in both political parties, women on the right and women on the left. Are there any other questions? What? Go on. But that gave more access to females. So it, it, it did give more access to females. That was one of the reasons for it. <laughs> uh, but you know, if we went from 150,000 people going to precinct caucuses to 4,000 people going to precinct caucuses, that's a lot of women who aren't going to precinct caucuses who used to. You know, and uh, and. There were women in politics and there would have been even more. And now that's not, that's a problem that's uh, that kind of inequality, but there's other kinds of inequality. I wouldn't say that everybody's got a perfect, every woman is equal. There's still problems, there's child rearing issues, there's all kinds of things, but there has been a lot of progress. Are there, and, and, and in all fairness, that was one of the reasons you had those rules changes. But. What question? Yeah, yes, I'd like to, I'd like to sort of stand up for the college kids a little bit. Yeah. You're right that they could they could dodge uh, Vietnam for a number of years by staying in school. But I'll tell you what, they were closely monitored, and I know because it happened to me and many of my friends. The draft board, they knew where you were. They knew how to get you. As soon as you graduated, you got induction notices ASAP, and if you drop credits in college you got inducted. That happened quite often. So the gentleman over here is right. The lower class people primarily were in Vietnam, but there were college people over there also. Oh, there were college students in Vietnam, but, but, uh, but uh, I, there's no question you're, you're right about that. But in terms of the proportion of the, uh, and the situation was better then than it is today, you know, yeah. in, in terms of that. But uh, it was much easier for ed educated, affluent people to escape the draft than it was for poor kids or working class kids. Yeah, and not, all, not, all, not all college kids were affluent. They just... No, but... It, uh, they trudged their way through college and they got drafted. Well... I think the percentage of college students who served was lower than the percentage of the general population. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. But well, I, just, I, I might be wrong about that. I just wanted to make that point. They weren't. No, it is a point. And I, I, they were there. Oh, of course they were there. I, I have friends who served in Vietnam. And one final thing, uh, you mentioned the draft. Uh, that bothers me to reinstitute the draft because if you put that back, it just puts a whole lot of bodies. At the, at the availability of 
an awful lot of generals that seem to be floating around Washington these days, which means we're going to be in a lot more wars if we have a much bigger army. Well, you might be right, and God knows I've got three children, two of them sons. I don't want them to be fighting in a war, but I, it, it, it's, I, I hope you agree also that the other situation where nobody serves is not a good situation. We're getting kind of close to that now. But if nobody's at stake, then who's going to oppose the war, you know? I mean, and a lot of wars get stopped because mothers don't want their sons to be killed. And um, we're moving towards a, a professional army, you know, and that's not a good thing for a healthy democracy. I mean, it's partly because we don't need, you know, in, in the Second World War, there were 12 million people under arms. Every able-bodied male was in the was in the army. Today, with nuclear weapons and missiles and those things, people think you don't need as many troops. Well, the problem with that thinking is that then the only way you can fight is with nuclear m missiles, you know. Uh, so I, I don't know what the answer is. If I were in charge, I don't know. If you were in charge, maybe we should not reinstitute the draft, but then what do you do? I, I'm not, I have to say I'm not in favor. People are for two years of voluntary service to the country. I don't think I'm for that because I don't think the government has the right to tell you that you owe that to your, you know, you got to go do this. Uh, maybe, I don't know. People argue about it. I, I, I can't answer you. There's no good, in my view, there was no good reason to, to, to be there. I think there. we have a question over here. Would you talk a little bit more about Hubert Humphrey? If he had parted with Johnson a little earlier, um, might he have won, or why did he stay loyal to him for so long? Johnson was a very vindictive person, and you were not loyal to Humphrey. You got yourself in deep trouble with him, and he was afraid that Johnson would try and cost him the election, of which I think Johnson was capable. But he should have, he should have become more independent. Uh, and, well, he paid a price for that. He lost the election. You also have to remember that Gene McCarthy did not support Humphrey until right up until the end. And I believe that he yep. actually cost him the election. And you can also remember that uh, Eugene McCarthy supported Ronald Reagan in 1980 when fellow Minnesotan Walter Mondale was on the ticket. Uh, McCarthy had a very vindictive streak, and McCarthy, if McCarthy had endorsed, the gentleman is correct, if McCarthy did not endorse Humphrey until about four days before the election, and that was a very weak endorsement. And I believe if he had campaigned for him that Humphrey would have won the election because it was a close election. But uh, that's true. I don't want to keep people here. Is there any other, is it time for us to? Oh, no, no, we got plenty okay, of time. Okay. <laughs> if you've got well, the time. I have no have time, but I don't want to keep people from the, maybe people want to be out in the rain. <laughs> yeah, one of the reasons they want a professional service is uh, there's so much technology involved then that when they, it's very expensive to train these. I've been on government tours of military bases. Yes. And, it's extremely expensive to train people in all the technology, and they don't want them constantly turning over. They want to hang on to the ones that can absorb the training. And they're denying people that aren't, are not capable of absorbing the technology. They're let go. They don't want them. They try to re-up, and they can't. That's, that's true. If you... If War is fought by drones. You know, to be able to service a drone and repair it and program it takes a lot of sophistication. I think that America, the American military has done a much better job than American business in recruiting people from non-educated backgrounds and training them to do these things. Businesses don't do that, but the, but the military does. And they give intelligence tests, and if, I don't care if someone's only had a seventh grade education, if they show they have some smarts, they can go from step to step and become skilled at that. Then, as you say, unfortunately, they get a job from a company that 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 pays more, so they leave. Training them is huge. Yeah, that's true. It's 
I'd like to ask another question about McCarthy. I was a you know very young McCarthy volunteer in 1968 in another state. I didn't realize that he went on to support Ronald Reagan. This, that's news to me. What was? It's, it's true. Yeah, I believe you. What was it about McCarthy's personality that made it first possible for him to take on the leaders of his party when no one else would, and then um, behave so? Well, so unexpectedly, let's say. <laughs> he was a very, um, he, he's not the way, <laughs> nobody up close is the way you see them. And he, I admire many things about him. He was very, very intelligent. He was extremely articulate. He was right about the war. That's a big thing. But he was not as perhaps compassionate <laughs> as a human being could be, and he was very vindictive, very vindictive. And, you know, these people, these great names can behave like children. Here's a story about McCarthy and John F. Kennedy. J J this is really before I was actually from but I, I got this from, from um, McCarthy's uh, administrative assistant, Jerry Yeller, who's dead now too, but when John F. Kennedy and Eugene McCarthy were elected in the 1940s to the Congress, they were two young senators. And they were the two up and coming senators, it was seen. They were both very smart. And they were also both Catholics. And so they were always invited to these di dinners, the Cardinal Spellman dinner, the such and such. They go all over where there were fundraisers and, 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 and getting the awards the, uh, to, uh, you know, just people of all backgrounds get invited to their to ethnic group dinners. So they went to a lot of dinners together, McCarthy and Kennedy. And John F. Kennedy, like most very, very, very rich people, was not in the habit of spending his own money. <laughs> he, the, 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 the rich people I know, the rich people I know, don't carry money with him. <laughs> Say, would you get this popcorn? <laughs> and uh, so Kennedy was like, so McCarthy and Kennedy used to go to all these things. And at all of them, Kennedy would, and McCarthy had no money. He was, he was, uh, uh, he had been a seminarian before he became a senator. He had just his salary, his Senate salary. And McCarthy, Kennedy made him, would walk out of the cab as if it was free and McCarthy would have to pay for it. And so on and so on, so wherever they went. So according to Jerry Eller, they go to a dinner, the Cardinal Spellman, whatever you call that dinner, it's a big, big, big dinner in New York, not just Catholic, but the Cardinal hosts it and everybody goes, it's a big political dinner. So they were the two guests of honor. So they get there and they take a cab to the Waldorf Astoria Hotel where they're being put up in a suite. And uh, Eller's there too. And so they get out of the cab and once again Kennedy walks off and and McCarthy pays for the cab, and he was in such a bad mood about it. He couldn't stand that, so they go up to the suite, and the suite has two bedrooms in the middle, a living room. And McCarthy, on the way up to the suite, buys the New York Times. And they get up to the suite, and there's, and there's, um, uh, uh, Kennedy, uh, sitting there and he says, oh, but McCarthy buys the New York Times and goes up, Kennedy says, oh, the New York Times, I want to read that. What part aren't you reading? And McCarthy's reading the front part and he takes the other part and puts it under his arm. <laughs> and Kennedy thinks it's a mistake. He goes, he tries to grab it up. No. <laughs> this goes on for about five minutes and finally McCarthy says, go down and buy your own damn New York Times, which Ke Kennedy sent Eller, who worked for McCarthy, to buy the New York Times, but, but and it was Eller's money. <laughs> but it was, but you know, can, can can great and famous people be petty? Yes. <laughs> Other questions? I think are people. On oh, here we go. Let's make this the you know, first question because I, I, I want people to be able to get to the Okay, well, this is sort of related to oh. now I was watching the news last night about the West Virginia primary, yeah. and you talked about mm. primaries being maybe more important now. And um, I just 
wondered if you had any thoughts related to that that you know have emerged from the, all the years since 1968. Well, when do the, anybody here remember when uh, Orville Freeman was governor of Minnesota? I came across a book of the campaign expenditures from his old campaign chairman when he ran for governor in the 1950s, and the campaign cost $112,000. And you know, that was probably quite a bit of money then, but you know, today, what a primary can cost 40, 50 million dollars, and it doesn't make any sense. And under the law now, you don't have to say where the money is from. And it's, it's, it's wrong, and there's so much personal attack, uh, you know, in the ads, that's, that's, that's unfortunate too. Well, this, I don't think it's a stretch that the problems of Vietnam have led to some of the problems of today. But I want to thank you all for being here, and I've enjoyed very much having a chance thank to Thank you very much, David Levadoff.